If you win a race, you get a prize. If a country wins a long and brutal war, its people expect a reward. In 1945, Britain emerged from the most devastating conflict in history. In a surprise election result, the people overwhelmingly voted in Clement Attlee and a Labour government that promised the prize of far-reaching social reform. We are not ashamed to proclaim ourselves a party of idealists inspired by a living faith in freedom, democracy and social justice. But could they deliver? The war had almost bankrupted Britain. Within weeks of taking office, Attlee was told he must abandon his cherished reforms and savagely cut the country's overseas empire. Attlee and his colleagues were not deterred. They pressed on regardless, taking an enormous gamble. What followed is a remarkable story of economic crises and political improvisation, of soaring idealism and petty egos, all held in check, well, just about, by a most unlikely Prime Minister. These were years of intense drama, but compared with the epic of wartime, the period after 1945 has almost slipped from view under the dust sheets of history. Yet Attlee's peace shaped modern Britain just as much as Churchill's war. Teetering like a tightrope artist from one crisis to another, Labour nationalised major industries and created a national health service. It also kept Britain in the game as a world power, secretly building an atomic bomb. For the left, this was Labour's finest hour. For the right, the moment Britain almost became a socialist command economy. To my mind, these were years of contradiction. At home, muddled socialism. Abroad, a wobbly resolve to keep Britain as a world power. And I believe that this tension between radicalism and patriotism was embodied in the man at the very top, terse, uncharismatic, but often very effective. The improbable Mr Attlee. Labour will now have a majority over all parties in a house of 640. Attlee didn't expect to win the 1945 election. He thought the Tories would get back with a smaller majority. But two days later, Attlee was at Potsdam near Berlin, replacing Churchill as one of the big three in the final Allied conference of the war. The new Prime Minister cut a rather uncertain figure. He blinked in the media spotlights and took a back seat in the proceedings, saying little. Attlee nods his head convulsively and smokes his pipe, noted one sceptical British diplomat. So who was this anonymous Prime Minister who appeared more at home in the sitting room than in the conference chamber? Attlee seemed the very opposite of a leader, a mousy little man with a moustache. He might have been taken for a retired headmaster or a suburban bank manager. For relaxation, he liked to curl up in an armchair with his pipe to do the crossword or to compose one of his corny limericks. Nor was he much of an orator. His speeches were delivered in a clipped, understated style. 
The Labour Party's great victory shows that the country is ready for a new policy to face new world conditions. The American president, Harry Truman, once asked Churchill to explain Attlee. Churchill frowned. There's uh, less there than meets the eye. The president ploughed on. He seems a, uh, a modest sort of fella. Huh, Churchill grunted. He has a great deal to be modest about. The young Attlee showed no signs of being a budding socialist. Born in 1883 to a prosperous city solicitor, he was the product of a Victorian public school education at Halebury, where he developed a passion for cricket. Imbued with distinctly upper-middle-class manners, throughout his life, he always dressed for dinner. After Oxford and the bar, the young patriot volunteered for service in the First World War. He fought at Gallipoli, rose to the rank of major, and was wounded by friendly fire in the Middle East. I got one bullet through the left thigh, and a large piece of shell case tore a considerable hole in my right buttock. Yet beneath the traditional phlegmatic exterior, Attlee was also a man of ideals. Appalled by the poverty he witnessed as a social worker in London's East End, he joined the Labour Party and, standing as Major Attlee, became an MP in 1922. This was a momentous year, for he also got married. Violet was his one and only love, and they raised a happy and devoted family. She loyally supported his career, although, like many wives of MPs, she sometimes resented his preoccupation with politics. In 1935, the Labour Party toppled its leader, and Attlee was chosen as a stopgap, acceptable to right and left. My colleagues of the Parliamentary Party have elected me chairman of the Labour Party to carry on for the remainder of the session. He lasted a lot longer than that. Attlee was cool and organised with a phenomenal memory. In 1940, Labour joined Churchill's wartime coalition and Attlee served as an energetic deputy prime minister. Attlee made his retiring personality into a political asset. No way could he out Churchill Churchill with grand rhetoric and flamboyant lifestyle. Instead, Attlee played himself up as Mr. Average, a leader with whom Middle Britain could feel comfortable. Churchill's trademark was the aristocratic cigar. Attlee's, the homely pipe. He had also become a skillful backroom political operator. At the end of the war, the party chairman, Harold Lasky, told Attlee that Labour needed a different leader to win the next election. But he was deflected with a matter-of-fact reply. Dear Lasky, thank you for your letter, contents of which have been noted. C. R. Attlee. On the day of Labour's 1945 election victory, there was another attempt to stab Attlee in the back. Herbert Morrison, his rival for the leadership ten years before, argued that the Labour Party should elect a new leader before the government was formed. But Attlee ignored Morrison and simply drove to the palace to take the oath of office. Attlee was a man of paradox. Shy, but courageous. Respectable, yet ready to take risks. A radical who was also deeply patriotic. And he was unpredictable. Sometimes he'd sit tight, not knowing what to do, 
On other occasions, he'd jump in a direction no one expected. So I think that Churchill's sneer was quite wrong. There was a lot more to Attlee than met the eye. This was just as well. On the new Prime Minister's desk in August 1945, soon after his return from Potsdam, there was a bleak memo from the Treasury, authored by the world's most famous economist. In strictest secrecy, John Maynard Keynes warned that Britain was facing nothing less than a financial Dunkirk. The war had cost Britain a quarter of its national wealth. With industry geared to arms production, exports had fallen to one third of what was needed to pay for essential imports. Financial aid from America had been vital for Britain's survival, but this had been cut as soon as the war ended. Keynes urged the government to bring soldiers home from overseas, both to save money and to get men back into industry. Attlee faced his first great test. Britain was alone. That's what Keynes meant by saying the country faced another Dunkirk, only this time financial, not military. In 1940, Churchill had gambled that Britain could hold out against Hitler. In 1945, his unlikely successor took a gamble that was no less risky. Whatever Keynes said, Attlee was determined to deliver the government's programme and keep Britain in the game as a world power. Lee moved fast, sending Keynes to Washington to seek aid. But with the war over, there was no longer any chance of a free gift. The British came away with three and three quarter billion dollars, but only as a loan. Back in war-ravaged Britain, the terms of this loan, to be repaid with interest over 50 years, were a bitter pill to swallow the Labour left resented becoming wage slaves to capitalist America. Britain was also required to end wartime exchange controls, making the pound freely convertible into dollars by July 1947. This looming deadline would be like a time bomb ticking away under the Labour government. To get the loan through, Attlee would have to win over a sceptical cabinet. Yet in this, he had a special advantage. One of Attlee's great skills was in managing meetings. He'd move briskly through the agenda. But unlike Churchill, didn't seek to dominate by his eloquence. He'd usually doodle away, saying little, but at the end, he would sum up the sense of the meeting gently tilting the argument the way he wanted it to go. Democracy means government by discussion, he once said. But it is only effective if you can stop people talking. Attlee finally managed to override the doubts of left-wingers. Reluctantly, a majority of the cabinet approved the US loan. Attlee had bought the country crucial breathing space. Now his government could get on with building the new Jerusalem, a massive reform of industry and welfare. 347 Acts of Parliament passed over the next four years. At its heart was the nationalisation of the country's main industries. The railways, coal, electricity, gas, iron and steel, 
even the Bank of England, were brought under public ownership. Nationalisation meant government taking responsibility for workers and their rights. But it was also about economic planning. Labour intended to streamline hundreds of small, inefficient companies and set production targets for the benefit of the whole economy. This leaflet is coming through your letterbox one day soon, or maybe you have already had your copy. Read it carefully. It tells you what the new National Health Service is and how you can use... What it the New Jerusalem was also about investing in people. Labour's second priority was a huge extension of the welfare state with a new National Health Service at its heart. As Minister of Health, Attlee appointed the 47-year-old Aniron Bevan. Here was a man of controversy. To his admirers, the darling of the left and a spellbinding orator. To his detractors, a champagne socialist and a Welsh windbag. Attlee's readiness to promote this fiery left-winger was a sign of the Prime Minister's shrewd leadership style. Better to have a potential troublemaker batting for you rather than bowling bouncers at you. And Bevan was also a big hitter of the sort needed to take on one of Britain's great vested interests, the medical profession. Strongly supported by Attlee, Bevan made a great leap beyond Labour's earlier plans, not just providing a free health service, but nationalising the country's 3,000 hospitals. And Health Minister Anarin Bevan cuts the first turf of the new £187,000 Woodbury Down Health Centre, the first of 162 similar centres planned. These were heady days for Labour. But reform on this scale cost big money. Attlee was a skilled manager of men, yet economics would prove his Achilles heel. The nationalised hospitals accounted for two-thirds of the health budget, and the bill kept rising. And nationalisation created other problems. The nationalised industries were run not by workers or by government departments, but by boards under loose ministerial control. The result was a new layer of semi-independent bureaucracy, which got in the way of Labour planning the economy as it wished. Bevan used the same unwieldy model to manage the National Health Service. Once again, Labour's blend of vision and improvisation had created problems. As with the nationalised industries, a system of regional boards made it hard to control policy and budgets. And so the National Health Service, Labour's most celebrated achievement, was born with a cancer, gnawing away inside. In domestic affairs, the government reflected the radical, reforming side of its Prime Minister. But Labour's foreign policy was more conservative. Here, Major Attlee, the patriot, held sway. If Nye Bevan was a surprise at the Ministry of Health, Attlee's appointment of Ernest Bevin to the Foreign Office seemed an even bigger shock. Negotiating the swing doors comes the Foreign Secretary. Everything he does has a determined, deliberate air about it. Ernie had been Minister of Labour in the wartime coalition. And Attlee had intended to make him Chancellor of the Exchequer. But he changed his mind at the last minute to keep Bevin out of domestic politics and well away from Herbert Morrison, the Home Secretary, and Bevin's arch-rival. When somebody once said that Morrison was his own worst enemy, Bevin shot back. Not while I'm alive, he ain't. <laughs> 
the Foreign Office was a monument to the age of empire. It was full of upper-class gentlemen of grand families, the products of Eton and Oxford. Bevin, by contrast, was illegitimate. He'd left school at 11, barely able to read and write. His education came from the Bristol docks and the trades union movement. But he had a keen mind and a huge ego. He kept up with his papers and he approached each problem with an earthy common sense. The diplomats soon took him to their hearts. Attlee left all his ministers to get on with their jobs, particularly Bevin. You don't keep a dog and bark yourself, and Ernie was a very good dog. Good dogs like Ernie, or naughty ones like Nye, Attlee had a rare skill at keeping them in the kennel. He knew many of them were big beasts and needed a long leash, but he could rein them in when necessary. Bevin might have seemed a square peg in a round hole. But Attlee understood the gut patriotism of the British working class. Ernie was a John Bull character who would go out to bat for Britain and the Empire. I will submit to no threats from any nation at all. After 1945, Jock Colville, Churchill's wartime private secretary, had returned to the Foreign Office. One day, he wrote a paper suggesting that Britain should give up Cyprus because it was likely to be an endless trouble spot. Much to his surprise, the memo went right up to the top and he was called in to see the Foreign Secretary. Now look here, Colville. What's all this nonsense you've been writing about Cyprus? Churchill says that Cyprus is British and Cyprus will stay British. And on things like that, Churchill is always right. You're looking a bit peaky. Who's the head of your department? Sir William Hater, sir. Well, you tell Hater from me you're to have an holiday. Take my advice. Go to O. Mrs. Bevan and I had a splendid holiday at Ove last year. Did us a power of good. Now, be a good boy. Off you go to Ove. And when you come back, you won't look half so peaky. And you'll stop writing all this bloody nonsense about Cyprus. Empire was the traditional sign of a great power. But just two weeks after Attlee became Prime Minister, America dropped atomic bombs on Japan. The question now was whether Britain had to become a nuclear power in order to stay at the world's top table. The situation was critical because all over the world, from Germany to China, the Soviets seemed menacing. As the Cold War deepened, Britain needed to be strong. But the Americans wouldn't share their atomic secrets with anyone, not even their closest wartime ally. So Attlee and Bevin agreed that Britain must develop its own bomb, as the Foreign Secretary put it colourfully. We have got to have this thing over here, whatever it costs. We've got to have the bloody Union Jack flying on top of it. For Bevin, the atomic bomb was a way to strengthen imperial defence. But Attlee believed it exposed the weakness of the empire. This new weapon has rendered much of our post-war planning out of date. Strategic bases in the Mediterranean or the East Indies are obsolete. The vulnerability at the heart of the empire is the one fact that matters. Britain still had two million men and women in the armed forces, a tenth of the total labour force. 
If Britain's bases would soon be sitting targets for a Soviet bomb, why not demobilise the troops and get them back to work, boosting industry? Attlee never brought the debate about whether Britain should have its own bomb before the full cabinet. I thought some of them were not fit to be trusted with secrets of that kind. He moved discussion into a secret cabinet committee, innocuously titled General 163, from which he excluded the economics ministers, who might question the cost. It was this body that took the decision in January 1947 to go ahead with a British bomb. Attlee then manipulated the defence estimates to conceal £100 million of expenditure. The Commons was not told for more than a year. This was Machiavellian politics of the highest order. It showed that when Attlee's mind was made up, he could be quite ruthless about getting his way. Up to now, his government had combined radical reform at home with a continued role on the world stage. It had managed to have it both ways and seemed on the verge of success. But in the new year, it became clear that Attlee was living on borrowed time. In late January 1947, blizzards swept across Britain. Snow continued to fall every day till the middle of March. It was the worst winter on record, and it nearly buried the Labour government. In this pre-oil era, 90% of Britain's heat and energy came from its own coal mines. As roads and railways ground to a halt, fuel could not be moved from the pits. Factories had to close. Nearly two million people were laid off and a war-style blackout was imposed. In places where work could be done, it was done by the flickering light of candles. And for hundreds of thousands of people, the effort to keep warm was priority number one. We alone of all the nations went through two great wars. We stood alone. For that fight, we put everything in that we had. We sacrificed all our wealth overseas. We converted all our industry. And that is why we are left in this position today. But the crisis was also an opportunity. Attlee could use it to advance his argument about the irrelevance of empire in the nuclear age. As the fuel crisis deepened, he seized his chance to cut back on Britain's expensive bases overseas. And he did so against the wishes of Bevin and the Chiefs of Staff. In one week, in the middle of February, Attlee persuaded a shaken cabinet to make three momentous decisions. It was the rising tension in Palestine that held world attention. Partition had brought a new flare-up in the strife between Arab and Jew. Politically, the conflict appeared to be... One was to cut its losses in Palestine, where 100,000 British troops were trying and failing to hold the ring between warring Arabs and Jews. The Cabinet agreed to hand the problem back to the United Nations as a prelude to a British withdrawal. A second decision was to pull British troops out of Greece, torn apart by a communist-led insurrection, and to suspend financial aid to the Greek government. In this case, the Americans were invited to pick up the tab. Most important of all was India. Here, Attlee was unusually passionate, having argued for years that Britain should give this vast country early independence. India, once the jewel of empire, was now a financial liability for Britain. In the crisis atmosphere of February 1947, Attlee persuaded the cabinet to announce a firm date for Britain's withdrawal. He hoped this would concentrate the minds of the feuding Indian politicians. 
and he appointed a new viceroy, Lord Louis Mountbatten, to accelerate the handover. The British had left by August 1947. Under Queen Victoria's great-grandson, the transfer of power is completed. Pundit Nehru, rejoicing turned quickly into horror and mourning. Throughout this vast land, Hindus and Muslims... In India and Palestine, Britain's hasty pull-out created power vacuums in which thousands died. Churchill was furious at the shambles. Scuttle everywhere is the order of the day, he told the House of Commons. Attlee had hoped for a more orderly transfer of power, but on the basic issue, he was unrepentant. Convinced that Britain had to cut its foreign commitments, he used the crisis of 1947 to wield the axe. The Attlee government had escaped its winter of discontent. But then, in glorious summer, the time bomb that had been ticking since August 1945 finally exploded. During the war, the government had imposed strict exchange controls to stop pounds being moved out of the country and to protect Britain's financial reserves. Good. Well, remember, you can take out five pounds in notes, but not more than five pounds. The maximum is five pounds in notes. Five. Five. Five pounds in notes. Get it? Ah! You mean five pounds in notes? Hooray! British tourists might afford a day trip to Dieppe, but certainly not a long weekend. Travel to the United States was almost impossible. But the price of the US loan was that Labour had to make pounds freely exchangeable into dollars in July 1947. The time for convertibility had now come. Within days, sterling hemorrhaged because investors were seizing the chance to get their money out of a weak economy and invest somewhere safer, above all, the United States. Yet Attlee and most of his colleagues failed to grasp the magnitude of this new crisis. The government, desperately in need of rest, went off on holiday in August. Bevin was in Dorset, Attlee in North Wales. While they were away, economic confidence collapsed. Shares fell by nearly 10%. By mid-August, Attlee was forced to return to London to chair an emergency cabinet meeting. Many urgent problems awaited solution, and the Chancellor was one of the men upon whom a greater responsibility than ever now rested. The Stafford Cripps was another. The cabinet decided on a complete U-turn to end convertibility and reinstate exchange controls. This was a national humiliation and a massive blow to Labour's self-confidence. In 1945, Keynes had predicted a financial Dunkirk. In 1947, it struck with a vengeance. But Attlee was no Churchill, galvanising Whitehall and rallying the country. Instead of fighting on the beaches. Attlee was, well, snoozing in a deck chair. When the crisis was over, inevitably there were mutterings that Clem must go. Once again, economics had proved Attlee's blind spot. His rivals smelt blood. The Daily Mail even ran a banner headline. Attlee resigning soon. Bevin to be PM. This was a leak from the very top. 
for the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Hugh Dalton, another of Attlee's critics, and Sir Stafford Cripps, the Trade Minister, both wanted Bevin to take over. Cripps went to tell Attlee so after dinner on the 9th of September. Attlee listened in silence. Then he picked up the scrambler telephone. According to Labour folklore, the conversation went something like this. Ernie? It's Clem. Stafford's here. Says, you want my job. Thought not. Bevin had stayed loyal. End of Cabinet Revolt. Then Attlee brilliantly turned the tables on Cripps offering him a vital new post as Minister of Economic Affairs. Cripps had entered 10 Downing Street that evening, ready to plunge in the knife. He went out as the Prime Minister's right-hand man. This was Attlee at his most improbable. Having botched the economic crisis, he handled its political fallout with consummate skill. When Dalton, the other plotter, stupidly leaked some details of his budget speech to a journalist and offered to resign, Attlee gladly accepted. After much coming and going of government leaders came the announcement that Hugh Dalton had resigned the chancellorship following what he himself described as a grave indiscretion to a journalist. For years, Dalton had barely concealed his contempt for the mouse, the rabbit, the little man. Now he had become the main political casualty of the economic crisis. In his place, Canny Attlee appointed, yes, you guessed it. And so Britain's number one planner, Sir Stafford Cripps, became Chancellor of the Exchequer in addition to his duties as economic chief. Never... Cripps was another of those richly complex figures at the top of the Labour government. Like Attlee, he grew up in a prosperous legal family. But Cripps stayed in the law to become a wealthy barrister. And he inherited not only his parents' ethical conviction, but also their religious faith. Cripps was teetotal and vegetarian. He seemed remorselessly high-minded. Churchill said of him, Yeah, but for the grace of God, goes God came early to Downing Street to catch a glimpse of Sir Stafford Cripps as he prepared to leave for the House of Commons. And presently, the man of the hour appeared, carrying the famous... Red Yet, as with Attlee, there was more than met the eye. Cripps's diet owed as much to health as to principle. For years, he'd suffered miserably from colitis, inflammation of the bowel, and this flared up acutely at times of stress. Cripps's background as a student of chemistry also set him apart from most politicians of his generation. It gave him a head start in understanding the issues of research and development that bedevil Britain's post-war economy. Cripps's policies as Chancellor seemed like an extension of his severe personality. He froze wages despite a rash of strikes, especially in the docks and he slashed imports and tightened food rationing to help the balance of payments. Britain was plunged back into an era of almost wartime austerity. The average calorie intake in the first half of 1948 was less than in the last year of the war. The weekly ration was 13 ounces of meat, one and a half ounces of cheese, six ounces of butter and marge, eight ounces of sugar, two pints of milk, and one egg. I know this Christmas won't be a luxury one, and that you housewives are going to have a hard job making a Christmas show. But the spirit of Christmas and its family happiness will encourage us all. It's the cheerful facing of our difficulties that makes our country strong. 
But Cripps also preached the gospel of productivity. He pushed Bevin and the defence chiefs to release even more men from the armed forces for key industries such as coal and textiles. The economy started to expand and the government could afford to remove some of the worst rationing, such as on potatoes and bread. The international situation had also been transformed. The Americans now feared that without economic recovery, much of Western Europe might go communist. When the Marshall Aid Pact was concluded, within an hour of its approval by the House of Commons, Mr. Bevin signed on behalf of Britain and Mr. Douglas for the United States. Under the Marshall Plan, the Americans pumped $13 billion into Western Europe over the next four years. And Britain was top of the list, receiving nearly a quarter of the total aid. Bevin had taken the lead in orchestrating the European end of the plan, but he wanted more than money. There's never been a dictator in the history of this world that hasn't talked peace when he's been preparing for war. Do bear that in mind. For a year, he wheeled and dealed with Washington, finally persuading the Americans to make a historic commitment to protect Western Europe against the Soviet threat. At Washington on Monday, the North Atlantic Treaty was signed. The solemn pact by which 12 great freedom loving countries of the world pledge common and immediate action in the event of armed attack upon any one of them. Foreign ministers of the country. For Attlee and Bevin, NATO, America's unprecedented peacetime alliance with Europe, provided a new anchor for British foreign policy. But then, once again, Britain's economic roller coaster lurched downhill. In the summer of 1949, world trade slumped and British exports collapsed. Speculators started a new run on the pound. Cripps's health was now as poor as that of the British economy. In mid July, the architect of recovery left for a complete rest at a sanatorium in Switzerland. Sir Stafford said that he was leaving all his worries about dollars and sterling behind him at the Treasury, and that he wouldn't think about them anymore until he returns fit and well. Unfortunately, the man who took charge of the crisis was, according to one Cabinet colleague, almost completely tone-deaf on economics. That man was none other than Attlee himself. The government was like an orchestra without a conductor. By September, Britain's reserves had dropped catastrophically and the country again seemed on the edge of bankruptcy. A solution was to devalue sterling. But this was anathema to Attlee and his older colleagues because in the sterling crisis of 1931, Labour had been stigmatised as the party that couldn't be trusted with the pound. Trapped between past and future, Attlee dithered. In the end, the decision to devalue was pushed through by junior ministers, led by Hugh Gateskill and Harold Wilson. Attlee went with the tide, and Cripps returned to announce the decision. Crowds lie in crisis pavement to watch the arrivals at a specially summoned cabinet meeting. I want to impress upon you the seriousness of the step that we've taken in changing the dollar rate of exchange of the pound sterling. In September 1949, the pound was devalued by 30%. To Attlee's relief, there was no repeat of 1931. Reserves rose and exports began to flow once more. Attlee's government had again plucked victory from the jaws of defeat. It's a sellout for the paper boys as a general election suddenly looms in sight. Intelligent anticipation or inspired guess, it focuses attention on the only man who knows the answer, and there's excitement as Mr. Attlee leaves number 10. In 1950, the exhausted government was coming to the end of its five year term. Early in the new year, Attlee seized his chance to hold an election. In a style very different from New Labour. Attlee was driven around the country in the family car, chauffeured by his wife, Vi. While she drove, 
he did the newspaper crosswords. Their luggage was one suitcase and a cardboard box containing a travel iron for Vi to put a crease in Clem's trousers. And in her spare moments, Mrs Ackley got out her knitting. Now it was up to the people to make their choice. Polling was exceptionally heavy in all districts. Discontent with Cripps's austerity had boosted Tory support. Labour did win a second term, but only just, with an overall majority of five. Next day, when Labour's bare majority was finally established, a cabinet meeting was held to discuss this really remarkable situation. And when it was over, this is what we were told by Mr Attlee. The result of the meeting, sir? Another meeting? Mm -hmm. We're carrying on, that's all. Uh, have you decided? Uh, yes, we carry on. You'll find a statement being issued. They were carrying on. But these were old men, many of whom had been running major government departments almost without a break for a whole decade since 1940. Not only Cripps, but Bevin was now seriously ill. And yet, for the first time, the health of the economy gave Attlee and his government some room for manoeuvre. In 1950, it could boast its first balance of payments surplus. Thanks to Cripps, devaluation and some good luck, Labour finally seemed to have created the conditions for an economic boom. So this was a real chance for Britain to modernise its industry or to get goods into the shops, to go for consumer-led growth. Here were windows of opportunity. Yet Attlee's government wasn't able to clamber through any of them because, once again, it was suddenly walled in by events. This time, the crisis was far from home, in a little-known country on the other side of the world, Korea. In June 1950, troops from communist North Korea invaded the South. President Truman rightly convinced that Stalin had given the nod, decided this was a crucial test for the West. He committed American troops to Korea and expected his new NATO allies to do the same. Britain's chiefs of staff had initially advised that this would be militarily unsound. But Attlee was deeply impressed by an impassioned telegram from Sir Oliver Franks, the British ambassador in Washington. Despite the power and position of the United States, the American people are not happy if they are alone. Korea was Attlee's moment. With Bevin and Cripps ill and exhausted, the Prime Minister took centre stage. He insisted that Britain must send its own troops to Korea. This, he said, was a vital test of the alliance with America. Like a more recent Labour Prime Minister, Attlee was willing to risk his leadership and his government for the sake of the special relationship. Aboard the carrier Unicorn, the first contingent of British troops head for a port in southern Korea. They had left Hong Kong to music and speeches, and their arrival in Korea was warmly welcomed. But Korea also sparked panic in Western capitals that Stalin might unleash the Red Army into Germany and France. This could trigger World War III. The Americans offered four combat divisions for Europe's defense, but they were adamant that their allies must also rearm. The Pentagon wanted Britain to commit itself to a defense budget of six billion pounds over the next three years. Labour had set aside only 2.3 billion. Attlee rose to the challenge. To replace the ailing Cripps as Chancellor, the Prime Minister promoted his young deputy, Hugh Gateskill, ignoring Nye Bevan, who desperately wanted the job. Unlike Cripps, who'd called repeatedly for cuts in the armed forces, Gateskill, with Attlee's support, now led the campaign for increased defence spending. After anguished debate 
Attlee and Gateskill secured cabinet agreement to double the defence budget. It wasn't as much as America had wanted, but it was considerably more than Britain could afford. A four-word phrase sums up the work of a Cardiff factory visited last week by a television newsreel cameraman. From buns to guns. Only a few months ago, there was turned out from this factory a machine that stamps the cross on hot cross buns. The left was horrified. Korea and rearmament shattered Labour's fragile consensus about the Cold War threat. Nye Bevan asked whether there were really hundreds of Soviet divisions poised to race for the Channel ports. And how would Britain pay for rearmament? When Gateskill tried to save money in other areas and suggested capping the ballooning cost of the NHS, Bevan told the Cabinet he would not betray the principle of a free health service. This had become a personal feud. Bitter at being denied the Chancellorship, Bevan was almost looking for an issue on which to resign. So once again, economic crisis caused a political mutiny. The difference this time was that Attlee's tired and fractious first eleven was at breaking point, and not even his skills as captain could stop the team falling apart. The showdown with Bevan came to a head when Attlee's vital ally, Ernest Bevin, was dying. He loved the Foreign Office and was desperate to carry on, but his heart and lungs were worn out and Attlee had to ask him to go. To add insult to injury, the hated Morrison took over his job. Ernest Bevin, six years Foreign Minister, hands over office to Herbert Morrison. At 70... The strain even got to the unflappable Attlee, who was struck down with a duodenal ulcer. Both Bevan and Gateskill were obliged to press their case at the Prime Minister's hospital bedside. Gateskill explained at length how he tried and failed to bridge the gap. He made it clear he would compromise no further. Attlee, pipe clamped between his teeth, shook his head and muttered, have to go. Gateskill sighed. He'd been Chancellor for only six months. As you wish, Prime Minister. First thing in the morning, you shall have my resignation. Attlee whipped the pipe out of his mouth and snapped, No! He'll have to go! Forced to choose, Attlee had to let Bevan go. He could not afford to lose his Chancellor. But by not questioning Gateskill with sufficient rigour, Attlee had committed the country to a defence budget that proved way beyond its means. He had also split his party. Outside the Treasury, anxious budget day crowds await the Chancellor of the Exchequer. What dreadful shocks are locked in the fateful red box? Young when Nye Bevan resigned, he accused the government of being dragged too far behind the wheels of American diplomacy and insisted that the rearmament budget would cause irreparable damage to the economy. The financial consequences were indeed dramatic. A balance of payment surplus of $300 million in 1950 became a deficit of $400 million in 1951. Just when France and Germany, Britain's continental rivals, bounced back economically, British export growth stagnated. Attlee had chosen, but rearmament on this scale proved an economic catastrophe. By the spring of 1951, the Labour government was on its last legs. Attlee's majority of five proved intolerable. The Tories mercilessly harassed them with late-night sittings and forced votes. Labour had to bring sick MPs in by ambulance to fill the Commons division lobbies. I consider the time has now come to ask the electorate for a renewal of confidence in the government and to give it adequate parliamentary support in order to deal with the important issues which the country is facing. 
at home and abroad. Attlee arranged a new election in October 1951. On the day, Labour actually won 230,000 more votes than the Tories, but gained fewer seats. Attlee was out, and Churchill was back. Churchill, Winston Spencer, 40,000. <laughs> The new Prime Minister honoured his campaign promise to set the people free with an end to rationing. The Tories cut back on defence spending and exploited the platform Labour had painfully created for economic growth. All this helped keep the Tories in power for 13 years. None of the big men of Attlee's cabinet ever held office again. Ernest Bevin died five weeks after resigning as Foreign Secretary. Cripps, a year later, in 1952. And after fighting and losing a last election in 1955, Attlee resigned as party leader. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall the sword sleep in my hand, till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. At root, I think, Attlee's government had a kind of split personality. Its leaders were radical reformers, but they were also men born in the 1880s who'd lived through two world wars and were slow to appreciate the full extent of Britain's decline as a power. Confronted with the Korean crisis, Major Attlee and his band of brothers opted for rearmament on a massive scale with disastrous economic and electoral consequences. But Attlee still left number 10 with a raft of achievements. Abroad, there was Indian independence and NATO. At home, Labour had extended the welfare state and revolutionised relations between government and industry. Even Mrs Thatcher couldn't dismantle the National Health Service. Attlee himself lived on until 19...